Hey, good afternoon. Please welcome the lovely Erin McGraw. Thank you. You know how this runs by now. We start with thanks for Wyatt and Barbara for their astonishing hospitality and the example they show us. I want to, well, Alan already beat me to this, so I don't really need to read off the list of Megan and Adam and Norris and Sam and Amina and Dan and Jonathan and Hastings and Kate and Gwen and Chris and Ranger and Thomas and Adam, thank you. Your patience is legendary. Um, thank you to the faculty, this group of genius and, uh, and kind and really funny people that I feel very privileged to be able to join. And, and thank you to everybody here. But, uh, every day I am just seeing so many examples of generosity and graciousness and I feel extraordinarily, extraordinarily lucky if I can get the word out. Thank you. And one last thing. I am the luckiest person in the world because I get to teach with John Casey. It just needs to be said. <laughs> For the last um, while now, for about a year and a half, I've been working on very short stories, running about two to four pages. So I'll be reading some of those today. I realized this afternoon that most of the ones that I grouped together have to do one way or another with the making or consuming of art. So I guess that's what we're gonna be, well, sometimes from very oblique angles, you'll see. Uh, this first one is called Nutcracker. Those of you who are close readers of Slate might recognize that I did a little borrowing. Right. Nutcracker. Oh, and these have happened in the last year. <laughs> Mom has been playing that awful plinky music all morning. Like grandma's, her face is smeared with excitement, and if they really want to do something for me, they can take themselves to the Nutcracker and let me stay home. I remember the first time I went to see it, grandma says. She wants to pull me into her lap, but she settles for stroking my hair. She used to have an Irish setter. <laughs> I was just your age. The music, the costumes, I'd never seen anything so beautiful. I dreamed of it for weeks afterwards. You're still dreaming of it, I said, which wasn't supposed to be funny. You've heard the music in ballet class, Mom says. Her voice is part coax, part threat. You know some of the dances. No, I don't. You were a waltzing flower. We didn't do the real steps, we just used the music. We're not good enough to do the real dances. It will be exciting to see the real dances and girls just like you doing them, not just like me. Girls who don't get dizzy and fall down on pirouettes, girls who don't clunk in their toe shoes, girls who, if they aren't performing, start pestering their mothers in August to get the tickets to the Nutcracker. I wanted so much to be Clara, Grandma is saying, to dance with the Nutcracker Prince. Oh, I dreamed of it. <laughs> Clara is an idiot, I said. <laughs> Here it comes, Mom says to Grandma. I didn't think she would start with the ugly until she was a teenager. Serves you right, Grandma says to her. She is an idiot. Tears start to crowd my face, and that pisses me off. If we're going to have this stupid conversation, I don't want to blubber. A spooky old man comes into the party and pays her a lot of attention and keeps touching her hair and then he gives her a special toy. <laughs> and nobody says anything. They just keep dancing around the stupid snowflakes and the soldiers and the flowers when he's going to take her away and hurt her and nobody's listening. The tears are everywhere now and the snot and mom is literally holding me by the wrist while she and grandma can't stop laughing. You shouldn't be scared, Grandma says, dabbing at her laugh tears. Good grief, child, it's ballet. It's pretty. It isn't pretty. It's spiky, like knives coming at you. Where does she get this, Grandma says. Mom shrugs. TV? We'll be going along fine, and then suddenly something will go wrong, and, well, well is me frantically trying to break away from her grip, which keeps getting tighter. Annabelle, stop. Just stop. You're too old to throw a tantrum. At school, my teachers tell me to name danger when I see it. Well, they weren't talking about the nutcracker, Mom says. <laughs> this wouldn't happen if you sent her to church school, Grandma murmurs. <laughs> not, not the time, Ma. When things are better, it's Mom and me against Grandma. 
Mom makes fun of Grandma for not knowing how to use her phone, and I show her new apps and settings while she tells me to slow down. Mom and I laugh. But now it's the two of them bearing down on me, waking for, waiting for the shell to shatter. Honey, smile. You're so pretty when you smile. Grandma's not as tall as Drosselmeyer, the man who gives Clara the nutcracker, <laughs> but like him, she grins too much and comes close enough for me to cough from her powdery perfume. Fuck you. I've been saving it up. <laughs> Mom is shocked enough to loosen her grip, and I'm out the door. She closes the door behind me. It's cold, and I don't have a coat. Who thinks that snowflakes are anything like ballerinas? Stinging pellets shoot through my socks. I tuck my fists under my arms and keep half running, half sliding away from the warm house. Mom and Grandma are probably still laughing the way you do when you know you're going to win. At the end of our backyard is a cruddy drainage ditch that doesn't get enough water to wash out the rags and plastic and food wrappers that slide down the hill. Stuff just collects. My friend Marnie said she found a syringe, but I don't believe her. She's too prissy to sift through trash for something as small as a syringe, and she never showed it to me. She came to school looking sleepy and said she'd shot up, but I don't believe that either. <laughs> it's ugly down here, but the sides of the ditch stop the wind, and it's too cold to stink. I smooth out two plastic bags and sit on them, pretending I don't mind the cold that flares across my butt. Everybody knows what happens to girls out by themselves in the snow, so I wrap my arms tight around my legs and wait for a man to show up. No man materializes. Aside from the shadows turning purple, nothing happens at all. I hear a door open and mom calls, Annabelle, you made your point. Come back in now. In a different neighborhood, she'd be worried. I'm shuddering more than shivering, heavy waves running over me. Mom and grandma agree that if there's a delicate way to do anything, I won't find it. <laughs> Another big laugh line. By the time I stand up, my feet are so numb, I'm walking like Bigfoot. I trudge up to the road and stick out my thumb for a minute, but that feels fake, so I just walk, clumsy on numb feet. 10 minutes? 15? I'm about halfway to the railroad crossing when the police car pulls up next to me. The lecture is everything I know it will be. Danger, risk, do I have any idea? I'm rubbing my feet. He takes me back home where mom and grandma are drinking Cokes and watching TV. Missing something, he says, pushing me ahead of him. Mom looks at Grandma. What do you think, Ma? Are we missing anything here? <laughs> I can't think what, Grandma says. The policeman has barely stopped laughing when he looks at me with his teacher face. Don't let me hear, you don't let me hear about you taking off again. Next time, you won't be so lucky. Mom pinches my shoulder, which keeps me from being nice. That's the plan, I say. Uh, last year, along with everything else that happened, I'm sure you were all as aware as I was that the second volume of James Kaplan's biography of Frank Sinatra came out, <laughs> weighing in at 992 pages, every one of which I read. But, uh, I'm, I, I'm just really interested in Frank Sinatra, who combined being a total thug with being an extraordinary artist. And I kept reading, thinking I would find the page that explained that scene to me, and I never did. Uh, but I learned a lot about Frank Sinatra. Um, and this story, called Ava Gardner Goes Home, takes place in 1952, which was um, a watershed in Sinatra's life. He had been this phenomenal success through the war and when girls were screaming and attacking him. Uh, and then the war was over, and all of those men came home, and they weren't so wild about this good-looking guy who had stayed home to romance their women. Uh, and he, he was out of sync with the music. He couldn't get his feet under him musically. This was before From Here to Eternity. Nothing was happening in the movies. And his career tanked. He, he couldn't get a job. He couldn't get a gig. Nothing. And um, in fact, a few months after the time that this story takes place, he, he tried to commit suicide. And, uh, and things turned around after that. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I thought you needed a little happy ending. Uh, to, um, this, this one is from Ava's point of view. And they did, in fact, go home to her, uh, her, her hometown in North Carolina in November of 1952. I used up all my capital for this, a visit to my sister's house at the junction of nowhere and no reason. Panic, which started ticking when I told my sister Myra that Frank and I were coming, took over on the flight from Durham to Winston-Salem 
and by the time we got to her house, I was chewing gum and smoking at the same time, my foot rattling like a machine gun. Every building in town is a dull cube, the Haynes factory squatting in the shadow of the water tower. Frank never would have agreed to come if he'd had a recording session, a movie, a single foxhole he could hide in. But these days, it's his wife who's paying the bills, and I get to insist on a trip that I myself have, not, have never made since I left North Carolina with a bad suitcase and a drawl. I got rid of them both. The whole town is in Myra's house. By herself, Myra cooked enough to feed the 10th Battalion, and still everyone arrives with a covered dish. Four boxes are stacked next to the sink, each holding a red velvet cake. After the kitchen table was covered with dishes, my cousin balanced a plank on chairs so we wouldn't have to put food on the floor. Frank's eyes are darting around the room while he talks to my cousins, their friends, every salesman and gas pump jockey in 50 miles. I need to get him a drink now. Me too. I say, Betty Louise, just look at you. You could be a princess. Betty Louise, who was my friend, opens her mouth and closes it again. She blushes and says, look who finally came home. I'm happy to be here, bringing glamour to poor old Winston-Salem. It's good to be out of Hollywood. I can't think why. You're my people, Betty Louise. I try to hold her gaze, but she won't let me, fingering her flimsy skirt. If Edith Head had tried to dress me like my people from Grabtown, North Carolina, she wouldn't have come close to these rayon floral dresses in brown and purple. Everyone is wearing their best. I think about the mink that Frank got me, and I want to vomit. How's your mama, Betty Louise? What's it like in Hollywood? Are there, her face goes so red it's almost purple, orgies? <laughs> <laughs> Not that I know about. Listen, Betty Louise, do you think there's any hooch around here? Not that I know about. <laughs> Myra wriggles through the crowd to get to me, staring at my cigarette. Ava, can't you get that husband of yours to eat? Look at him. I lost that battle a long time ago. His face looks especially gaunt with everybody pressed up against him. The girls who want him to sing and the men talking about the war and then saying, oh, but you wouldn't know about that, would you? He looks at me and I smile, meaning thank you, and he glares, meaning you'll pay. I glare back, meaning you owe me more than this, you prick, and Myra interrupts us. Eva, look who's here to see you. You remember, Dr. Milton. His perfectly round face glistens, sweat beads along the part in his greasy hair. Even though it's November, it must be 90 degrees in Myra's front room, and my, tight dress and my tight dress lining sticks to my back and thighs. Frank's probably sweated right through his suit coat. Dr. Milton says, every time you have a new picture, I tell people that you sat in my chair. This is clearly not all he tells people. His fat hands twitch toward me, and I flash my best smile across the room at my rigid, furious husband. I tell the Hollywood dentist that it all started here, I say to Dr. Milton, then cite Myra's husband, Brawny, on the other side of the cakes. Brawny always knows where the bourbon is. Please eat and help us with this food. I need to greet my sweet brother-in-law. Dr. Milton looks at his sleeve after I touch his arm, and nobody can blame me for wanting to wash my hand. Brawny used to throw mud at me. Now he can hardly speak. When I whisper to him about liquor, he swallows and nods. I glance at Frank, backed right up to the wood-paneled wall by men who are mostly, one way or another, kin, my kin. He looks like he's drowning. I'm drowning too, but I've gone to his damn mother's house often enough. Does he think I've forgotten the years he didn't get divorced, expecting me to sit and wait for him? And now we're married, and not even Hedda Hopper can count the times he's been unfaithful. She can count my times, and does. Sweat is running in a steady line down my neck. There's no way to sneak outside without dragging the whole house full with us. So I announce that city boy Frank has never seen country stars and we all troop out. It's cold enough in back to see our breath and prickly sourwood leaves attach themselves to my stockings. In the dark, I'm counting on Brawny to get a flask to the men, which will work its way to Frank. Get one for me too, I told him. Myra doesn't need to know. I keep greeting people, hugging the girls and smiling at the men, hearing the crowd around Frank getting louder. He's acting the Hollywood bumpkin come back to find what real America means. Gee whiz, he says, and it's good that the darkness covers my face. <laughs> and his. He's not a real actor. He's one take Charlie. He can drop into character for a few minutes, but then it drains away and he's just Frank again, the washed up crooner who still sneaks back to see, my lo to see long suffering sainted Nancy, the mother of his children. Three nieces come toward me, giggling and shoving each other and pointing at my shoes. Do you get to keep the clothes you wear in the pictures? 
No, Dolly, I have to go out and get my own clothes, just like you. Grandmama makes my clothes. Gee whiz, Frank says again. Where the hell is Bronnie? A hand rests on my elbow and I jerk away. Too late, I see it's Myra, hurt moving across her gentle face. I press my cheek against hers, soft as powder. Thank you for this. If Mama had lived, she says wistfully. At that moment, I have two wishes, to know the rest of her sentence and to swallow a mouthful of bourbon. I can only have one wish, and Bronny is edging across, around the crowd toward me. Sure, Frank says to someone, stepping forward and addressing the rake propped against the porch as if it were the microphone at the, on stage at the Paramount. Here's a little song people have been liking, ladies and gentlemen. Just like that, as if he planned it, he launches into It's Only a Paper Moon, his voice so jaunty a person might miss the rage. Enough light comes from the kitchen window to see his gaze on me at first. My nieces and cousins and aunts and friends scream and fall at his feet like the last 10 years haven't happened in Winston-Salem and Frank is still a star. His smile glints and he starts to sing to his audience, those stupid shrieking girls. They are my people and now they're his. That night, Frank and I will fight so bad we'll both have to wear sunglasses the next day. When Bronnie presses the flask into my hand, I kiss him, making sure Frank sees. That's what will start the fight. Alyssa, are you here? No? Okay. That's, uh, this next story is, uh, well, uh, as some of you know, Andrew and I have been renovating our house here in Suwannee for a really long time. Uh, and we have therefore spent a lot of time with contractors and various kinds of uh, construction guys. This story deals with some of that. Uh, it is not about Joseph Sumter. I want to go on record with that. It, Joseph has nothing to do with this story. It's called Cliché. The house would depress Jesus. My, you know this house? <laughs> My 10-year-old son walked in, wa walked in once right after I started working there and right away saw the nail pops and the badly cut drywall. Some of the outlet plates don't even cover the holes. 700 grand, grand, which is what it costs to get bad drywall in Orange County. The homeowner saw an 18-foot ceiling in a bonus room. She didn't notice that the loft looked into a wall. She didn't see the corner that dropped away in the living room, probably from a dissolving foundation. She didn't even see the windows clouding up because they were installed wrong and now the seal was broken. She was not smart, which was good because she didn't see me watching her. I've heard the stupid jokes and I knew the cliches, which never applied to me. No client ever slipped off her robe when she saw me coming. I never had to explain to my wife a strange pair of panties in my pocket. I didn't do that shit, and neither did the other contractors I knew, though we laughed over beers at Hollywood's ideas of our lives. I didn't like myself for knowing where she was whenever I was in her house. I didn't like remembering the music she listened to. I didn't like my eyes for noticing the glints of red in her hair, illuminated by the light coming through the crappy window. Where do you want the outlet to go? With other clients, I found out about kids and vacations. To her, I said, are you planning to stain this trim? She held up two paint samples. What do you think? I couldn't stop myself. I said, that one, because the other one would look like chalk, and it was important to me that she live in a nice house. At night, I thought of her and twitched with the need to save her from bad choices. When I got home, I checked my son's homework and snaked the bathtub drain. I became super husband since taking this job, and my wife smiled when I walked through the door. I wondered how much deceit a marriage could contain. At work, the homeowner asked me to recode her garage door opener. There was a manual. All she had to do was read it. Instead, she stood next to me while I read, then trailed me to the garage while I instructed her to punch in her new code. Don't tell me what it is, I said. Silly, I trust you. You want to keep the information to yourself. Her blouse was buttoned wrong, and it was unbelievably hard not to reach out and fix it. Put this manual someplace safe. If you want to change the code, it will tell you how to do it. If I want to change the code, I'll call you. A few times I stayed late, hoping I could meet her husband. It would have helped to shake the man's hand, but he worked late paying for that shithole house and his wife was alone a lot. She wasn't alone, she was with me. I was hired to work on an addition. 
Once the addition was finished, she kept finding new jobs for me, and when those threatened to end, I drew her attention to a crack that ran all the way around the downstairs bathroom. Is it dangerous, she said. Only if you want your house to keep standing. Her, house, her face was a cartoon of confusion and sweet alarm. This was what Betty Boop would look like if she was talking to her contractor. <laughs> I would look like the wolf. I went back to that house yesterday. It's brown now, and the trees make it look less crude. Kids' toys are scattered on the driveway. Either she's a grandmother or she sold the place. I heard that she and her husband split, but I don't know whether that's true. Even now, I can make myself gasp a little at the idea of her available. I got out of that job without ever kissing her. All my crazy pent-up need went into the next job, Marcy, who broke up my marriage. She and I lasted three years, pretty good for how these things go. Three years after that, my son started to talk to me again. Eventually, we pasted the edges back together. He comes and sees me sometimes now just because he wants to. I live in a house south of town. It isn't much, but the land is good, and I keep the place clean. I could bring a woman there without feeling too bad. Most of the time, I don't bring a woman there. That fire burned itself out after the divorce, after Marcy, after I lived through all the destruction that I knew I was bringing on myself and couldn't stop. Didn't stop. Of course I could have. This house used, that I used to work on looks pretty good now. Somebody's keeping it up. The gutters look good and the roof and the mulch is pulled away from the foundation. If I look at it like this from the street, it's a solid house that could hold any number of good lives. If I tilt my head just a little, I can feel the edges of the old thrill. That's all it takes, that little tilt. This is called The Tenth Student. One out of ten. The other nine slump into my house because their parents send them and they lie about practicing. When I put the sheet music up, they squint at it, unsure where to put their hands on the keyboard. I'm so busy. I'm not like you. I have a lot of things to do. <laughs> no one else's life is ever real, is it? especially the life that belongs to the wispy-haired piano teacher with the bad apartment and the good Baldwin. That life is a soap bubble until the tenth student comes in, the 15-year-old with the long hands that are constantly moving. There has to be a way to make a, to make a crescendo at the de capo, the tenth student says. Isn't that what I want? Stupid people imagine that the living room, sorry, stupid people imagine that the living dream of music is happy. They've never looked at the tenth student's trembling mouth just on the brink of an expression. Exultation is exhausting. The tenth student isn't here to learn how to play. The tenth student knows everything about playing. I teach the tenth student what the music can bring, our ruination. The music wants to bore into the heart of the universe, find the black, hot, embracing core, and bring it back for the rest of us. The music wants to expand our souls until they shatter. This is the reason I've torn my nails to shreds by the time the 10th student comes for the weekly lesson, even though the 10th student arrives early, a personality trait. The 10th student comes early, pays up, and when the 10th student plays, I brace myself and then still flinch because the fulfillment of beauty is always shocking. My tax return lists me as a music teacher, but the truth is that I listen for my living. I've heard everything whispered outside my apartment, the jokes, the gasps, the shushed repetitions, Language is as flipper-footed as a seal, and it allows us only to say a few blunt things over and over. So I have learned not to say love or beauty or special. I barely say talent. One student was taken away from me just as the student began to approach rapture, a word I was idiot enough to use. The world is poorer now, and the student is in Florida, enrolled in a college program that teaches hospitality. I don't claim to be the only one who can listen. Often the parents of students, one through nine, make a point of coming to the lessons and listening to every word I say, glaring. Help yourself to coffee or water, I say. Bathroom's right down there. I'm fine, says the glowering parent, not about to leave a defenseless child with a teacher who talks about rapture. <laughs> students one through nine mostly hear what they're told to hear, though every once in a while when the seasons are changing and the air tilts, they sometimes hear the edge of something new. They change their posture and shift unhappily on the piano bench. Whoever said that we want to hear a thing we never heard before? That, I say. Play that. They don't. They're one through nine. 
Usually they stop playing well before they come to the sharp moment, quick as a pin that stops their breath. I'm the one who hears it. After they leave, one through 10, I play and cats run away. Students scuffle outside my house, standing at the window and straining to hear. I don't care when one through nine are there. They think I sound perfect, which is depressing, or that I sound just like them, which is also depressing and closer to true. <laughs> I play so the 10th student can hear me. The music I make is bricks tumbling down metal staircases, a fork tine screed over glass. It is a screen door slammed eight times in a row. It is a concrete block heaved over the edge of a rowboat, slamming a still breathing body to the bottom of a lake. It is the entire sparkling universe snapped in two, like an LP over the knee of a piano teacher. I play every night. All right, two story warning. These last two, it seems to me, go together, although you're going to have to tell me if it's anybody other than me who thinks that, but they, they seem to me very linked. Um, and that's all you need. Right. Hope. I had never been on TV before and didn't even pull a comb through my hair before I came out to face the reporters. As soon as the cameras came on, I smiled, then begged the abductor, rapist, murderer, to turn himself in. My smile a gash across my face, I pleaded with anyone who might have seen my daughter snatch from our broad daylight front lawn to call the police. Please, I said, smiling. I was begging God just the way I'd been trained, full of confidence that he would answer my plea. The smile was proof of my hope. I was holding up my end of the bargain. Lori had been 12, Randy's and my only child. Investigators found the lawn edger she had been using tossed into the laurel. The perp wanted to make sure she didn't have a weapon, one of the investigators theorized, excited to use his police word. Later, we would find out about the maroon Honda CRV with the plates that had been switched and the little girl five miles away who had been approached first and who screamed like an air raid siren until the CRV roared away. Lori, a dreamy girl who, like gardens, must have fallen into his hands like a plum. For weeks, I kept the pleading up, praying without ceasing. I took my despair, which took root early, and, I, and which I refused to name, and twisted it into unrecognizable shapes. My smile distorting my face, I reminded God that he promised he would never abandon us. Randy got quiet before I did. After dinner, he sat on the couch and didn't even turn on the TV, his face slack, as if he were made out of cotton wadding. Lori had chocolate brown hair like his, and sometimes she joined him as he pottered in the garage. He would come back in the house and say wistfully, she's growing up fast. He moved out after six months, even though we are still married. The Lord once joined us, another one of his promises. Even though we came in separate cars, we kept going to the same church, kept taking in Faith's sturdy food. Pastor Michael, a good enough man who looked like he was drowning every time he glanced my way, urged me to lean not only on God's promises but on my church family, my brothers and sisters ever quick to remind me that God has a plan and that everything happens for a reason. They didn't need to remind me. The universe in all its glory quivers with reasons the Lord Almighty might allow a girl on the edge of womanhood to be abducted from her own front yard where she was working for her naturalist badge. Maybe God didn't like petunias. Maybe he was teaching me what happens to careless mothers. Maybe the sight of a 12-year-old bending over to dig out a stubborn root was more than even God could resist. He wanted another star in heaven, said Teresa Mimford, after we found out that Lori was dead. Teresa beamed as if she were offering comfort, and I felt my horrible smile stretch across my face. So God can just reach down and take whatever he wants? How exactly does that make God different from Charles Lewis Brown, parole violator with multiple priors, everything from DUI to armed robbery to, yes, of course, sexual assault. He looked at my girl, saw what he wanted, and took it. Maybe Charles Lewis Brown, currently appealing his life sentence, was the hand of God reminding Randy and me just who Lori belonged to. Maybe I shouldn't see Lori's abduction as a tragedy, but as a demonstration of God's unfathomable love. Maybe I should be on my knees every day saying, please, sir, I'd like another. It isn't long before you start having thoughts like this. We don't know where her body is. Charles Lewis Brown, who of course insists he had nothing to do with Lori, even though strands of her long hair were wound around the seatbelt buckle, will not tell us where he put her. She is with her Lord and glory, says Teresa. I hope so, I truly do. 
But if Teresa expects me to cheer up as I ponder Lori edging the heavenly lawn, then she has a better expectation of my faith than I do. What I find myself hoping is that Teresa will lose something that she loves so she can get a taste of God's heavenly food. Wicked thoughts like these come wreathed in flame. The slyer ones are dull, voiced like logic. Mine isn't the only tragedy in the world. What about Lloyd Nathan, centered in the front pew every Sunday, even after burying two wives and visiting his youngest boy every month in the state penitentiary for intent to distribute? He sings hymns week after week, full of pleasure in his Lord's crown. Or Tilly Florington, her ALS far enough progressed now that she participates in the service only by jerking her head from side to side. I can see hope shining in her sunken brown eyes. Why aren't those eyes darting from side to side, looking for the cure that surely she's prayed for? Why does Lloyd talk about miracles when none ever come, came for him? We have been promised a banquet and served crumbs. Why does no one notice? New words are boiling up in me, new ideas. I'm recognizing just what kind of God I've been worshiping all this time, and every day the impulse to share becomes a little stronger. Randy saw something in my expression the Sunday after Teresa got her breast cancer diagnosis. He grabbed me by the shoulders and steered me away from her. Don't take her faith away. It's all she has. Then she doesn't have anything. It's not your job to tell her that. Randy's voice was tired. His mouth drooped. His eyes blinked too much. Everything about him looked defeated. But here he was at church again, hoping in the Lord always. I said, you knew, didn't you? Way deep inside, you knew there was never going to be a miracle. I don't know what you're talking about, he said, his eyes on his shoes. Since he doesn't want to sit next to me, I sit alone for the service, studying Teresa, half shy when she lets Pastor Michael lay his healing hands on her. Her face is wrapped. I'm not a mean person. After service, I head for the parking lot. Teresa's the one who speeds up to catch me, grabbing me by the wrist. I need you, she said. Teach me. I don't know how to cope with stage four cancer. How do I pray in the face of that? How do I hope? Her eyes, her whole face is shining. She looks like the glory of the Lord. I say, keep God in your every breath. Keep him before you. Will he save me? She says. He will, I say, going under. You can't imagine what he will do for you. There's one more. There, um, this one actually uh, comes with a little bit of a soundtrack, uh, a lovely tune by the guitarist Fabrizio Sotti called Paradis. So this one is called Paradise. These times come for no reason and too rarely, days and evenings that quiver like a bee's wing. Though I'm just sitting on my concrete back stoop, looking at my neighbor's heavy-headed peonies while a beer sweats between my hands, I envision fragrant vines draped from balconies. A breeze floats, across, floats my sleeve across my arm. Nearby, a bobwhite whistles, and my skin wants to dissolve and let something pure slip free. Today at work, I sat in my cube and proofread page after page, using the tricks I've developed to keep focused, then eventually letting the focus go. No one but me has ever cared when I missed an apostrophe. In the car on the way home, the ease of mere pleasure rose around me like water, and when I opened the car door, it spilled out in an ecstasy of nothing, of the moment I happened to be living. Now, I thought, now, the words meaning teasingly out of reach. This isn't the life I meant to have. I'm not saying it's worse. When I was 14 and my sister was nine, she nagged me until I took her to a dog show. Our parents wouldn't allow pets, so she papered the walls of her bedroom with pictures of snowy breasted collies or Irish setters, their coats like fire coursing through rough brush. I loved my sister. It was no hardship to go with her and look at the pretty dogs. We were allowed into the staging area where a mastiff swabbed my sister from neck to hairline in a single lick, and she hit me when I pulled her away. The dogs panted on their grooming tables while their people buffed toenails, whitened teeth, brushed and brushed and brushed. The handlers had dog paraphernalia we could never have dreamed of, socks and headbands and jackets with their breeds on them, a car with a German shepherd painted across the hood. The lady with dachshunds wore a ball cap that had a tiny stuffed dachshund sniffing a fire hydrant on the bill. <laughs> Lori nudged me when she saw it and we had to run out of the tent because our laughter overcame us. Lori's dead now, DUI blood alcohol point 12. Her peeling laughter used to unfurl all the way across the playground. From the back of my yard, a green scent drifts up, thicker than pine, a heady invitation to bees. Lori would have known the plant, its perfume a bright feather. 
Nothing you love is ever gone, some people say, and I have no idea whether that's true. She would have known the scent, I don't, and here I am opening my mouth to let the sweetness in. I expected so many things. At 16, I began to save items for my apartment in Madrid or Leningrad, places I believed I had a right to. A book about French painters, a yellowed comb that I thought was made out of bone. My mother would hush my father when he started to laugh. There's nothing wrong with ambition, she told him. I spent a full year sulking when I found out that my community college didn't teach Russian. My mother kept quiet two years later when I put a down payment on a one-bedroom house six blocks from where I grew up. By then, she and dad were divorced, and she was happy to have me close. My friend Rael used to live across the street, and after my boyfriend and I broke up, she came over at night with a six-pack and a listening ear. She would rub my shoulders until I pulled away. Rael made this stoop, knocking together the form and pouring the concrete so that I could have something nicer than wood plank steps coming out of my back door. Pure kindness on her part. She spent an afternoon staining it, decided she didn't like how orange the stain came out, sledgehammered the whole thing, and started from scratch. I wanted it to be nice, Rael said. I don't know where she is now, wouldn't know where to find her, but the thing she did for me waits every day when I come out to look for finches, which she taught me to see. Rael wanted me to love her, and I didn't, and she created the stoop for me anyway. Now I remember her every day. That's how love works. It took me quite a while to figure this out. Almost a year has passed since a man has come to my house, and sometimes I feel lonely, though often not. At night, a street light shines through the bright crabapple leaves in my yard, and the color sizzles. Once it was enough to illuminate mating raccoons. They uncoupled, washed their hands at the bird bath, then scurried apart without another glance. <coughs> a younger me would have strained to find a meaning, but what is meaning against the rough coats and velvet hands of two raccoons humping in flat, buzzing light? They were beautiful, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> After my sister died, I got an Irish setter, a roly-poly puppy who grew into a lug-headed brute. He charged in any direction he pleased, no matter how I tried to restrain him. And when he got away from me, he ran for miles, his tongue and tail bright pennants. I loved that dog like breath. When he smiled when he saw me, and at night he'd tug off my, uh, my slippers and socks, then lick my feet from ankles to toes until he'd lick the day away, a trick I never taught him. The day I had to put him down, internal bleeding, no choice. I did all right until nighttime when I laid on the couch, my feet covered, and tears shuddered out of me in waves. I won't get another dog. Without any effort, I recall the feel of his lavish coat, its cobwebby strands fine enough to clog the furnace filter. After he came in from a long run, his coat smelled like grass and dirt, a clean smell that I buried my nose in. The memories are on every side, and all I have to do is let them carry me. My sister and I were going to go to Africa when we were old. She wanted to see giraffes. It comes again, that feeling that will not be commanded or contained or even named. The bob white, the thick scent, the pleasure of this moment obliterates thought. Quivering, shapeless emotion spills and floods out of me. I'm surprised the lizard at my feet isn't washed away. Maybe this is grief. Who cares what we call it? Joy comes in waves and will not hear no. Thank you very much.